With this lesson, we start our last unit of grade 11 physics, and it kind of comes full circle. We're going to bring up the vector things that we talked about way, way, way back on our first day of physics when we uh, talked about relative motion. Before we get into it, let's just say I gave you this weird looking graphic, this weird map. Um, I pulled it off the internet. It's an image describing the wind during a typhoon. If you just looked at that image, could you pull anything off of it? Could you read it? Could you come up with an answer of where the wind is blowing the hardest? Or maybe where it's not blowing the hardest? Uh, could you pull off directional information like where is it blowing north? Where is it blowing east and west? Things like that. I'm not a weather expert. I've never learned how to read maps, but I would guess, I'm not even going to answer my own questions, I would guess that down here is where there isn't a lot of wind. Um, there don't seem to be arrows, and the little arrows I see are really, really short. And conversely, uh, again, I can't read it very well, but these arrows up here look like they're really long. So I'm going to guess that's where the wind is blowing the most. Um, in this kind of corner down here, the arrows seem to be pointing to the west, so I would say that's where the wind was to the west. Over here, they seem to be pointing to the east. Here, they seem to be pointing north. I don't really see any place where they're pointed straight south. They're pointed on a funny angle in this top corner. So yeah, I guess with a little bit of thinking, I could read that graphic. The connection is that diagram, it's a weather version of it, but that is what we would call a vector field. It's a whole mess of arrows, and they're showing the direction and magnitude of some vector. In that case, the vector was wind velocity. What we're going to tackle today, or start tackling, is field theory, so that kind of idea. But we're going to apply this vector field to, instead of wind, we're going to apply it to gravity, electricity, and magnetism. Before we get into it, um, we're just going to sort of dip our toe into this big theory that is called field theory. We're going to start set up some basics. In grade 12 physics, we circle back and we kind of extend what we start this year. Uh, depending where you head to university, when your math gets better, you'll come back to field theory and do it again. Um, even if we just like think about this wind example, imagine if you had to try and come up with equations to describe all these crazy arrows in this box. It'd be tough to do the math to describe those arrows because they're kind of all different sizes, they're all different directions. If we wanted to tackle that, maybe we wanted to code the computer to show that, it would take a little bit more math. So as your math gets better, you'll circle back and do a better job of field theory. Um, on top of that, this map that I've shown you is what the wind was at a particular time. Um, a few minutes later, a few hours later, the wind would all be different. So the vector field of the wind in this case would be changing over time. Uh, that brings in a whole calculus thing, how uh, quantities change over time. So that's a whole other math issue that we have to get better at before we can push field theory as far as we can. Uh, specifically, uh, electric and magnetic field theory is going to show up if you do anything sort of electronic. Any sort of wireless communication deals with electric and magnetic fields changing over time. So let's say you go into electrical engineering or different fields like that. Um, your math needs to get better, but you will definitely be circling back and learning more field theory. For now, we're going to start off with just some baby steps. We're going to learn the basics of field theory, and then, like I said, in grade 12, we'll circle back and add to it. Um, moving along, historically, um, field theory was literally invented because the physicists of the time didn't have a good way to explain what they called action at a distance forces. They didn't have a good answer for why or how gravity does what it does, electricity does what it does, and magnetism does what it does. A long, long time before that, way back in the 1680s, Newton came up with an equation for gravity. But even when he came up with it way back in the 1680s, he didn't like it. It works really well. That's the theory that uh, the gravity equation we used at the start of unit two. Um, it still gets used. We'll use it again in grade 12. I'm told that uh, astronomers still use it. It's got a place where it works really, really, really well. But Newton didn't like it because it didn't answer the why. 
So Newton didn't write in English, so this is translated into English. But basically he's saying um, that gravity would just work uh, one body upon another at a distance through a vacuum without the mediation, without anything else happening, um, and by and through which action and force may be conveyed from one to another. So that one object could sort of magically create a force on another is so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has, who has in physical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. So way back pre-1700, so a good 100 years before we invented field theory, when Newton came up with gravity, he basically said that unless you're a knucklehead, so unless you're, uh, if you don't have any competent faculty of thinking, so unless you're a knucklehead, you shouldn't buy into this gravity. You shouldn't believe it because gravity, the way he's worded it, is just a magical attraction. Uh, there's other quotes out there, uh, again, translated because Newton didn't speak English. Well, he didn't write in English. He spoke English, but he was kind of a, kind of a weirdo. And whenever he wrote anything academic, he didn't write it in English. Uh, but so I'm told. Um, but there's other quotes out there that he didn't like his theory of gravity because he said it kind of brought uh, magic back into science. We don't know why the apple fell off the tree and hit him in the head. He didn't give an answer for why. It was almost just sort of a magical thing. So fast forward into the 1800s, physicists came up with an, a theory, um, a set of rules, a set of ideas which explain why these um, action at a distance, the big three, gravity, electricity, and magnetism, they came up with a theory for why or how they work. We're going to go in order. Even though we've already talked about gravity when we did forces, I want to backtrack and talk about gravity again, um, laying down some foundational ground pieces so when we bump it up to the weird electricity and even weirder magnetism hopefully uh, they make a bit more sense so here's field theory uh, when we talk about gravity um, gravity is all about mass so what field theory says is if you have any object with mass it's surrounded by an invisible gravitational field a vector field that we're going to call a gravitational field the gravitational field is a vector field but in this case, instead of showing the strength of the wind, the arrows show the direction a small mass, an imaginary secondary mass, would be pushed or pulled. To make it click, let's consider the Earth. The Earth is this great big heavy thing. It's a round rock, basically. Because it's got a lot of mass, it's surrounded by a big gravitational field. To picture the gravitational field, imagine what another mass, which way another mass would get pushed or pulled, if it were near the Earth. So we literally just imagine another mass. So I'm going to mess up my picture. I'll uh, imagine a mass right here. Which way would that mass get pushed or pulled? Gravity's kind of boring. Gravity's always attraction. So a mass right there would get pulled down towards Earth. A mass over here, imaginary mass, same thing. It would get attracted in, pulled towards Earth. Down here, pulled towards Earth. Over here, an imaginary mass, pulled towards Earth. Wherever we imagine a mass, it's going to get pulled towards Earth. That means that the gravitational field of Earth is a bunch of arrows pointing towards Earth. If you didn't know anything, if I just kind of like the wind diagram, if I just gave you that diagram, hopefully you would look at it and say, oh, I can see that the, if I told you that the arrows were force, um, you would say, oh yeah, based on those arrows, I know that the force would be towards Earth. I'm not going to do a real derivation of the equation, but basically what we saw when we did our forces unit is the equation for the gravitational field, we saw it before, is the gm over r squared. g is the gravitational constant, m is the mass of the object, so in our diagram the mass of the earth, r is the distance from the center of the object, so um, from the middle of the earth out to wherever we imagine the mass to be, that's what we would have to use for r if we were calculating um, the gravitational field strength at some point. We saw that equation before. Uh, we plug in the numbers for the radius and mass of Earth, like if we're standing on the edge of the Earth, that's where the 9.8 newtons per kilogram comes from. The 9.8 is an answer to the gravitational field strength of Earth when we're on Earth. So it's really telling us how strong this vector field is if we are standing on Earth. So if you're standing here, 
the gravity on us would be 9.8 newtons for every kilogram we have. That's what the gravitational field is. It's this invisible field triggered by the existence of math of mass. Anything with mass is going to be surrounded by this invisible field. The invisible field, because gravity is attraction, is going to be pointing towards the mass. Now, to get to force, that's what Newton didn't like. Um, what field theory says is that, that we have, if we have two of these masses, and if they're close enough together that their gravitational fields overlap, it's the overlap of these fields that triggers a force, and we'll come back to it in grade 12, the overlap of the field also stores energy. So now it's not a magic thing anymore. Things don't attract just because. They attract because of the overlap and interaction of these invisible gravitational fields. The equation for gravitational force, it's the exact same equation that Newton came up with. Basically, we take that G that we said before, GM over R squared, and we multiply by the other M. So force of gravity is GMM over R squared. G is still the gravitational constant. Capital M is going to be the mass of one object. Usually, I make it the bigger one. Little m is the mass of the second object, and r is the distance from center of one to center of the other. The exact same equation. Field theory didn't change the equations. It just changed the logic, the reasoning. If you've got something with mass, it's surrounded by an invisible gravitational field. That's why there's gravity. And that vis invisible gravitational field gives you an idea of the direction of the force. If you've got two things with mass, and they're close enough together that those two gravitational fields overlap, that means there's going to be a gravitational force between the two things. So um, I didn't give myself much room, but let's do a little bit of doodling down here. Let's talk about, if we were in class, I'd do something silly, like pick any two random objects in the whole universe. So we could pick, oops, we could